Great. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to kind of invade your brains for a little bit. I've been looking forward to this since Dr. Schaefer and I were talking about this a while ago. Um, I guess I could give you just a little bit more of a insight kind of behind me. I uh, grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and ended up moving down to Southern California, wanting to focus my efforts on composition uh, and music. So I was really just had an attraction towards uh, film music and video game music. Um, do we have any composers here who, who have an interest in exploring music and film and media? All right, cool, we got a handful, wow. I gotta tell you, that's, that's, that's more than in my undergraduate program. So this gets me really excited. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I went to school down at Cal State Long Beach, which is where Dr. Schaefer and I had met. I was doing my undergraduate. And Dr. Schaefer, you were doing your doctorate or was it your graduate? Uh, I did both my undergraduate and master's degree at Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, right. and I think we crossed paths during my master's degree. I think that's correct. I think so. You're right. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. This is back in the 1800s, by the way, a very long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, it, it, I always had this affinity and passion towards marrying music to the visual arts, you know, and, and it was really cool to have professors and instructors who encouraged that outside of even film, but also in dance and theater. Um, it was really, really fun experience there. So I wanted to, you know, work on the big Hollywood movies, work on the next big, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean movies and Marvel movies and all that. And growing up listening to Danny Elfman, John Williams, and Tom Summer, of course, and I wanted to work alongside them or be the next one, you know, and uh, through our late uh, chair of our music department, Dr. Carolyn Bremer, she was able to make some connections with the studio and they started an internship right after I graduated, which I was very fortunate enough, which then turned into a job. Um, but I very much started as an intern. Um, and just to give you a full disclosure on most internships, has anybody here done an internship or, or have some kind of on the horizon? I know it tends to be, okay, we got, we have one, okay. Um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing at studios because well, I think a lot of people, especially a lot of kids that go to Berklee College of Music and they have their specific film scoring programs kind of go on there thinking, oh, I get to sit next to the composer and I get to write alongside them. And, you know, I get to pick their brain and see how things work. Uh, where the reality is you get really good at making a really good cup of coffee and taking out trash. Uh, that's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a big part of the, of the internship experience pretty much at any studio. Uh, but fortunately, I was able to make some pretty heavy connections. I had a five-week internship there while uh, Hans was finishing up The Dark Knight Rises. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of being there, being there, helping the studio out, running errands. Um, and by the time my internship had ended, they had this wonderful sampling department that was there just open and kind of ready for people to jump in. And, um, you know, it was my understanding, like, well, I'm sure they're going to hire you know, from people who have experience in sampling, because honestly, at that point, I really didn't have any experience in sampling whatsoever. You know, um, to anybody who uses VSTs and sampling instruments as, as have been created, it's been really fun to look at. Um, you know, a lot of nowadays, it's in the box, and it's all kind of set up and beautiful and perfect for you, where, you know, even five, 10 years ago, let alone 15 years ago, it wasn't quite the case. Uh, but they had brought me on and said, hey, you made a decent cup of coffee. Do you want to start making some instruments for Man of Steel? And I said, sure, I know how to do that. Not at all. But, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they encouraged, uh, rather Hans encouraged, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of learn stuff. And, and um, even having not had an engineering background whatsoever, I, I heard, hardly knew what the terms, you know, what those two words Pro Tools even meant. It, it was kind of a matter of seek or swim. And, you know, I took some swimming lessons when I was a kid. So I said, I may as well put this to the test. And uh, fast forward 10 years later, through a lot of uh, hard work, a lot of late hours, a lot of extraneous times looking at a computer screen and recording stuff. Um, I've been at a studio and been one of his primary digital instrument designers um, since then. And it's been really kind of one of the coolest experiences I think I've ever had. Um, just being able to to think about music differently uh, when you jump into sampling and thinking about how it really works, not just in media music, not just in film music, you know, it's in any genre these days, you know, um, 
we, we now kind of use our computers as our orchestra in a lot of ways, right? You know, we have the capabilities of doing that. And um, what my job really in, entails is it's really not a place of trying to replace instrumentalist musicians. And I think it often gets a, you know, kind of bad rap about that of thinking, okay, well, samples are here to, you know, I, I've once been called, <laughs> I use this story a lot of having, you know, artists and saying, well, if I'm Ariel, you're kind of like Ursula, you know, I'm signing away my voice to you and now you have it in the palm of your hand and you'll never need me again because you have that essence and that's it and you're gone forever, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that just really isn't the case because the truth is there's a lot of stuff that we do in sampling that um, we just wouldn't dare want to torture our musicians with, you know, um, I think uh, including for one of the projects, Dark Phoenix, I don't know if anybody saw Dark Phoenix, it was a more recent X-Men movie. One of our vocalists, Suzanne Waters, this whole movie, this story was about her brain being infiltrated or, or about, you know, Jean Grey being infiltrated by these alien, alien sounds and being, you know, this very cerebral thing happening. And so Hans came up with the idea, said, well, what if we had some alien chatters going on in the brain? Um, so within two and a half weeks, we recorded a bunch of short notes, mutters, chants, whispers, every vowel, every consonant. Uh, Suzanne's entire range from top to bottom, multiple dynamics, multiple velocities, um, everywhere from whispery, crypt-like silence to bombastic, loud, in your face, you know. And uh, I think we calculated in two and a half weeks, we recorded over 21,000 bits of audio of her voice, which then went to his sequencer and he built out this insane uh just suite of sounds that you wouldn't even imagine like you would there's no way you would be able to tell that's an alien chatter but we found it's a lot easier if we can take these little increments bit by bit by bit and really kind of mess with them in his sequencer and and all these you know processing programs and kind of reinvent that sound it's a lot easier to do that than to record her a thousand times going -a 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 -a. it just it gets really exhausting um and I should also mention, you know, by the end of every single uh, sampling session, there's always a time where the musicians will come back when we're doing the live recordings, um, you know, and and I, I, I'm sure we've all, ex you know, we've all studied extended techniques in, in certain areas of, of, of music and Western instruments. And there's definitely some that people are open to, but you have a cellist and then say, hey, can you just do Colenio for 45 minutes straight? They're probably not going to be very happy with you. So in these certain situations, it may be a little bit easier to kind of capture that sound a couple of times and then we can really mess with it. Um, but we kind of I like to look at my job and kind of what we craft at the studio as, you know, an easy way that I like to describe it is if you look at Hans or the composer as a painter and his digital audio workstation, whether it's Logic, Cubase, Pro Tools for Composers Who Dare. Um, <laughs> if that's his canvas, my job is then to go out and fetch the paint that he can then, you know, get his mural done with. Um, and it's a lot of fun because at the end of the day, it really comes down to story and storytelling and what is the narrative. I mean, you kind of look at these samples as the alphabet that he's using to write his narrative with, you know, um, and always combining that with live musicians and live orchestras. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting place because it's kind of hard to describe this job without in introducing, you have to know engineering, you got to know producing, you obviously have to understand the language of music enough. Um, it, it's part sound design, it's part scripting, it's part coding. Um, there's so many aspects to it that go into making it into these big scores that nobody would even really know, um, you know, exists because most of the time, these VST instruments, these sampling instruments, you can buy from third-party libraries. If anybody's heard of companies like Spitfire Audio or 8DO or Berlin Strings or any of these, you guys have heard of these? I'm seeing some head nods. Okay. It's very squinting over there. Okay. So basically what these companies are doing is they're making these, these you know, patches available to you at your fingertips so you can play them anytime. You know, they're commercially available, so you don't have to worry about royalties or anything like that. You just got to worry about either the one-time purchase or the cloud subscription. I don't know how they're doing things these days. Well, that's essentially what I do, but specifically for Hans and for his movies and his projects. Um, 
And, and it's cool because it's, it really makes you think about music differently. Um, you know, it's, it, it, when you start thinking about the story and the narrative of whatever is happening on screen, we all know it, we're all, you know, musicians and, and kind of jumping in that world. You understand it's, a, it's, it's quite a different language. And when you start working with directors, do we have anybody in here who's worked on their own film projects or work with directors or people outside of their own music? Couple, a little bit. Okay, great. Um, it's it's a really interesting process, especially if they're not musicians themselves, because, you know, they're, they're kind of used to speaking a different language where directors are pretty much quick to do and understand a little bit of everything. You know, they know acting enough to direct it. They know wardrobe and lighting and aesthetics and all these things. But music, as we all know, is kind of its own world. Um, so we've often found it's really helpful when you can have uh you know, just new elements and new toys that you can introduce in each story. Um, you know, perfect example was Man of Steel. It was the first project that I worked on. And it was a very, uh, it was a very intense project, but, you know, he wanted to be really cheeky and say, well, this is the sound of America and we need endless wheat fields. And, and you know, what's more, what's more American Man of Steel than pedal steel guitars? And so we got, you know, eight of the top, you know, pedal steel guitar players uh, in the world to come over and we essentially treated them like a string ensemble we had a string section we had bass section we had pedal steel celli pedal steel viola violin um, basically doing what they do best and doing these really cool slide intervals um, seconds fourths fifths everything you can think of short notes long notes um, and it was fun and you know we're recording it and I'm building out and I'm like I have no idea how he's going to use this but there's always a method to his madness and madness is a world he knows quite well. Um, and sure enough, he, that ended up becoming one of the strong pillars of the Superman theme. Um, you know, and it's, it can be a pretty, uh, pretty cool experience to kind of see how things can completely reinvent themselves. And I think even musically, it helps you as a composer to understand, you know, we take so much time studying and focusing on, you know, uh, the range of each instrument and its capabilities and talking to the musicians, what can we do? How can we push this? This is kind of that same way, but mostly in the digital world, right? How can we take these string of sounds that we've created and find a way to tweak them and mess them in, in our software and process them to kind of make them sound a little bit new? Um, and I will say this, you know, the goal is always the same to make a good soundtrack, but it really is also just a constant push to say something new and say something inventive, you know. Um, my studio is kind of like that headquarters for that. Anytime, usually when there's a new trend for film music or video game music, a lot of times it's not too far from our place, you know. Can't begin to tell you how many times people, you know, I've talked to them about my job and they're like, oh, wait, so you were there when they did the inception bombs. And I got to tell you, nothing drives us more crazy. And we're like, yes, but that was many, many years ago. There's so much more to be said with music at this point. Um, but that's that's kind of the like long and short of, of where I'm at with with that. And, um, you know, last year, two years ago during the pandemic, uh, you know, it, it kind of shows how much working well with your team is a very vital thing in any aspect. And I've been working there for so long and our team is constantly evolving and growing together. But um, how, how many people in here saw Dune part one? Anybody see Dune? Cool. Cool. A lot of people. Uh, so most of that score was done from home and we put out three albums for that. So they can kind of tell you one, how passionate and how excited Hans and our team was for this project, but also, you know, how well our team can work when uh, things are getting a little crazy and the world shut down and we're not sure if we're going back in, right? We all took that one week off in March and thinking, oh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks and fast forward a year and a half later, you know, we're still kind of working through it. Um, but, you know, a lot of those sounds and textures either came from the book and, um, you know, uh, came from uh, his own mindset. We worked with several musicians, three vocalists, um, who I'm hoping to show some examples of shortly, uh, who kind of crafted their own language to create the language of some of the vocal chants you hear in Dune. Um, you know, uh, we took these percussive elements from destroying piano lids and breaking uh clay bricks with chains and two by fours and just these really destructive sounds and built the drum kit out of it i'm sure everybody remembers arriving at house of trades and all of a sudden there's these big bombastic 
uh, bagpipes, like what the hell are bagpipes doing out here in space? <laughs> so, but it was all these different ideas that from the beginning, we had no idea if it was going to work or not, but it was really a matter of creating the sonic landscape. It's less about the motif and theme and more about immersing you in this world sonically and musically. And a lot of that stems from the instruments. We had so many instruments that were custom built for this project different mic techniques that people were using, putting their microphones on their throat while they're even doing these tube and throat singings and making these, you know, mastodon horns that one of our one of our woodwind players created, you know, instruments that don't exist anywhere else in the entire world, but right here in the score. Um, so it's 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 definitely gotten me to think a lot more outside of my own um, my own music, you know, and thinking how do you implement these stories and these techniques into your own, uh, you know, your own daily life and your own curiosity. Um, because it, like you said, it's not a matter of replacing anybody. It's rather just kind of embellishing the capabilities that we can do. Because at the end of the day, samples really are a performance that's frozen in time, right? And as beautiful as it is, there's still the element of human error that we like as musicians, people in general, right? We like to hear that. We like to hear the human nature in it. Samples can can be really cool and having some sort of fundamental foundation for whatever you're building. But ultimately, it really is about people. It's about the artist, you know. Um, currently, I'm in Los Angeles, and there's no shortage of talented musicians that all moved out here from, from their hometowns wanting to make it and this or that. Um, and I would love to work with everybody. Uh, but there's a very specific reason why Hans works with someone like Tina Guo who can jump seamlessly between Rammstein and Stravinsky and you would have no idea that she jumps into both worlds. I guess they're kind of in a similar vein, one could argue, but regardless, um, you know, it's about her essence and her performance and her instrument and how she plays it, um, you know, and, and that's kind of what it comes down to is really just the artists working together. We can find people to make noises, you know, pretty easily as, as most of you have been doing on your own. But it really does come down to working with the artists and having them kind of put in their their uh, uh, sound into it and their texture, their signature. And that's really what makes these samples, I think, special. And for some reason, it just sounds different than a lot of the stuff you have kind of out in the rest of the world. Um, so that's kind of my long and long of it backstory. Um, I will say this right now, if they have any questions, guys, please, I am so informal about things, just please, uh, you know, I, we can definitely save some for the end, but if you have anything, please definitely, definitely come at me here. Um, but Dr. Schaefer, I was wondering if I may be able to, I don't know if I'm able to show anything or play any sound bits. I don't know if that's going to translate across the, it should, right? Yeah, you're absolutely welcome to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, you know what? Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. Uh, in the meantime, though, if there's any questions or or if there's anything, uh, you know, I can help um, talk about while I'm doing this fun little experience. Um, um, I'm gonna ask. Uh, so, like, when you get to like sampling stuff and it gets into like the tens of thousands of audio files and stuff like that. Um, I assume it takes a lot of organization and filing. Like, do you have any like tools for that, or is that just as tedious as it sounds? Oh, oh yes. Um, it is really all about organization. Um, I hate to say it, but it's true. Uh, it because you're right. It is. It's. It's not like we're sampling just three layers and one round robin and ten notes. That's fine. No problem. Uh, we have different ways of trying to automate it as best we can. Also keep in mind, we're doing multiple mic positions. It's not just mono. It's not just stereo pairs. Sometimes, you know, if anybody's mic'd up, you know, a drum kit before can be a lot of microphones. Um, so usually in Pro Tools now, in Pro Tools, it's easier now than it was 10 years ago, where now you have something called batch clip rename. And you can kind of go in and name everything the same way that you need to. Um, but it's, it's still at the end of the day, as much as you can use that or use automator, um, cause we run on Apple, uh, Macs. Um, uh, I think we also use keyboard maestro. That's pretty helpful too. And that does macros. So you can just like, you know, name every sample the way that you need to, before you print it down into the way it has to be named. Um, 
our our uh, sampling software that we use that's in house um, is very uh, it's it's specific in the way that it um, that it's built where the naming convention is very uh, specific. So if we name a file a very particular way with its velocity range, where it lands in the MIDI world, you know, the name, the like note name and all of that, it will, it will automatically map it for you. You can do that in contact as well, which is something I'll definitely get into a little bit later. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's still at the end of the day, as much as we would, I would really love if uh, <laughs> we could just have a computer do it for you. It's sadly not the way. And, you know, there's some truth to that because you want to make sure that you're still quality controlling it as best as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot. So the long and short of it is it's extremely tedious. It's always going to pretty much be tedious, but that's also how you train your ear. You know, that really is, that really is, is the best way to go about making sure you understand exactly what's working and what's not, which is why labeling is important. I, I've had to take old sample packs and old sample libraries from pre-existing from before my time. So I'm definitely not the first person who's been sampling at the studio. And sometimes I'm hearing a pop and a click in something in one specific note, but the, but the file names are all numbers and zeros and ones and all these other things because somebody didn't label it properly. So if I bring everything into Pro Tools, I don't know exactly where it is. Um, so it makes it a lot easier when you can make sure everything is organized as uniquely and specific as possible. Um, so that way it's a pretty easy fix and a pretty easy find. So um, did, that, did that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, okay. I believe. Okay. I have a link I can email you, or I guess I could put it in the chat here, can't I, Dr. Schaefer? Yeah, just drop it in the chat here and Great. I'll open it up. Great. I might need to see your screen so I can kind of. Uh, indicate because it's a lot of stuff all over the place <laughs> totally yeah let me uh i'll share my screen with you Great. okay nope that's not it <laughs> anybody else any other questions or anything so far while we get things started i promise this is a coffee it's not a white claw it's too early <laughs> <laughs> There we go. All right. Let's... Shall we play it? Well, yeah, I think we're going to need to jump around a little bit because as you can see, there's a lot of gaps. Oh, um, yeah. So we start at the very, very, very beginning of this. Can you, can, if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind just playing, starting from, if you move your mouse over to where, uh, yeah, the start of that is. Yeah, go ahead and hit the... Mm -hmm. All right, here it is. Great. Uh, pretty lovely romantic stuff, isn't it? Um, <laughs> if anybody recalls, there was a movie that came out a few years ago called Dunkirk, probably one of the biggest uh, uh, war movies that's come out in the last several years. Um, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. And it's probably the hardest project we've all worked on collectively. It was a lot of, um, a lot of hours. Um, and the way that Hans really wanted to approach the score for this one truly was you have kind of three stories that are happening in this 90 minute film and three stories that are being told from the land, the sea and the sky. And so his idea was, well, how do we represent that as best as we can with 
the instruments that exist and instruments that don't exist. So in this particular session over at Air Studios in London, we remotely recorded 32 bass players playing very specific figures, and that was a particular one. And the idea was, what if we were to write this figure that could sound really like a plane dive, like a dive, like a like a dive bomber coming in and, you know, and under the right context, when you match that with the score and the sound design, it, it, it almost sounds like sound design. Um, but getting everybody together to kind of do that and be, you know, in sync enough, but just a little bit off as well, so it's not so stale, um, was pretty challenging. Um, and there's, you know, this this is a sound that was used exclusively in the score itself. You can hear it on the score, um, and uh, uh, in in the film and also on the soundtrack because this project. It was such an undertaking that there were two scores made. One was on screen, and there was one that was separate where it was a soundtrack album. And that one was basically one long bit of music, which was one of the hardest things that I think Hans had to do and even us um, because it was all about timing. Typically films are in reels and you're writing music cues per reel. Sometimes they cross over, but for the most part, there's not wall to wall music, but Dunkirk there was from the very beginning all the way to the end, there was music and it acted a lot as sound design. Um, but I thought that would be kind of a cool thing to show you guys. I don't know how big it was in there, but especially when you get those kind of big beefy dives, um, kind of hits you hard. But the idea was to emulate as much as we can this iciness, this cold, uh, no room for hope um, exploration. This is one of, let me put it to you this way. Typically on each project, we're probably making anywhere between 15 to 30 instruments, okay? And that's recording, that's cleaning up the audio, that's finding out the right, which articulations we want to use. It's going through every single aspect of it. And that's quite a bit. For Dunkirk, we had over 350, so in less than a year, which is quite a bit. Um, and not all of the instruments got used because the movie kept changing and ideas kept shifting. Um, but again, it's about creating this vocabulary. And that sound doesn't really exist outside anywhere else. I mean, there's a lot of these library companies that will then take, oh, you know, they did this or another composer did this. Let's try to find a way to make this accessible. But again, Hans handpicked these bassists himself. He knew which ones he wanted to use. He knew the room he wanted to use. He knew which uh, mixing engineer he wanted to use for these. Um, and when you have that, it can kind of turn into something really, really cool. Um, if we can go back to the Dropbox so we can show a little bit more stuff. Um, great. Uh, this next, next section here. Yeah, can we hear it real quick? I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> here it is. Okay, great, 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 great. So this is this is what I was telling you about the Man of Steel pedal steel guitars. Um, actually, if we want to go back to it, these these are some of the slides I was telling you about before. That just you know um, these were all. This was about eight pedal steel guitar players that all kind of played in different various realms of their comfort and we were able to get these textures. So if you play through just the section right here, you can kind of hear it. Okay, here's, here's a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So th I think that actually was probably the first instrument I had actually worked on. And I, you know, I learned a lot about pedal steel guitars and the things that work great with them, things that don't. But when you take that and you listen to the Man of Steel score, it's all over it. And you wouldn't, you would have no idea. You really wouldn't. But it's these little things. It's these tiny little fragments that take a lot to produce and make. But when you have that vision, it's not a matter of making it the focus of everything. It's rather saying you've built out your mural and you know this one tiny little thing where it can sit and rest. And uh, without it, it's lacking something, you know? Um, and so that's really cool to be kind of part of that, that, um, that environment and that process. Um, if we go back to the Dropbox link, uh, I think let's skip that tiny little, hum yeah, if you go to the one a little bit further back, no, that one, yeah, let's hear that. Can I get it more than good? I can't get it more than good. 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 I
Tudom, mennyi egy kicsit drága kincsit, bén is csőzém, minden zsörem között lelke. Drága kincsit, bén is csőzém, minden zsörem között lelkeséget gazdag lelke. De hogy csak nagy lelke, ez az agnégységet gazdag lelke. De hogy csak nagy lelke, ez az agnégység. Congratulations, I have just put a curse on all of you. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty creepy stuff, right? Uh, this is from Dune. Um, this is one of the many textures that we explored with uh, just before everything shut down um, and these kind of vocal chatters and, and stuff that Edie Lemon Bodiker had come up with herself. Um, I think some of it was rooted in Hungarian because that's where she's from mixed with some other stuff. But when you layer that onto the score of stuff, it really comes out more as a texture than really needing to understand what each word is saying. Um, we had our three vocalists come in and they just knocked it out of the park, coming up with their own language, their own rhythms. We took words from the uh, from the actual book itself um, and, and you know, recorded different quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, multiple different dynamic, multiple velocities. Excuse me, that, um, you know, you could then build out these weird, creepy little textures that, again, it's not necessarily something that's going to be at the forefront but it just adds more of that uniqueness to what it is that he's building. Um, one of my colleagues, Suzanne Waters, who I mentioned earlier, who worked on Dark Phoenix, one thing that was really fun that we Hans wanted to do was to take her voice and actually synthesize it. So she did all these long layers and patterns and sounds, and he then ran it through his, his granular synth program um, and processed it quite a bit. And he basically synthesized her voice. And I have an example of that. If you want to, if we can go back, um, it should be that next big hump right there. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, not too bad. Um, that's one vocalist. We, we just had a very specific way we wanted to track her, very dry, and just started building all these crazy, you know, frequencies and these these har harmonics that she was hitting, and then really fleshing them out and building them out into, into one thing. I mean, that's that's a whole cue right there. You hold down that chord, and boom, there's your scene, right? Um, but again, it's it, these are the types of things that we're building. It's just, it's you have to be playful you have to be creative you have to really try to push things out that you know that sound really doesn't exist anywhere else you'll find them you'll find stuff similar to it but this specific artist her specific tone her texture her quality the warmth of her voice um you know it's something that she's of course like any musician has mastered and it, you can really hear it in it you know um and so that this is like the really fun part of my job. I love being able to take it and see what we can build it into. And then obviously, of course, how he ends up using it in the score. But again, think of this more as this is your alphabet. You know, these are your colors of paint that you're painting with. Um, and it really does influence how you're going to write your score. Because if we're just using the same instruments, the same sounds every single day, it's one thing I always encourage my interns, you know, I never tell people go spend thousands of dollars on these sample libraries because you probably don't have thousands of dollars to spend on these sample libraries, but also if everybody's using the same sample libraries, essentially all your stuff is going to sound pretty similar. So why not throw in, even if you're recording on your iPhone, you know, that is something that's going to be unique enough to you and help you get the tools to learn how to start listening differently, you know, um, and, and it just takes a bunch of experimenting and, and kind of messing around with stuff. I'd like to show you one last thing when I was talking about the, um, the percussive elements that we used um, in Dune. Um, if we can go back to the link, I think it should be 
I don't know what that is. Let's play that. I don't think that's it, but we'll hear it. Nope. Yeah, that's some ear splitting stuff. This, this might be it. Let's hear it. Okay, so if we jump to the next part. So that was essentially me and my colleagues years ago, letting out a lot of aggression. <laughs> we were just basically experimenting in our room. You know, we were, uh, this is this the sounds that we had to just kind of build up our own ears. And uh, Hans said, go play. You know, you have a pretty destructive room. We have all these empty, you know, tools that we can use. Bring these into your room and just beat the hell out of them. So we did. Um, we had no idea what they were going to be used for. And then he ended up building a drum kit out of it. And this ends up in Dune as well in the score. It's a very kind of industrial sound, but um, you never really, you, know, you don't know. So sometimes we're doing stuff specifically for it. Um, while we were collecting more sounds, we realized we had so many that never made it into a project that were just kind of sitting there. So, well, how do we repurpose this and make this work for the film? And this was one of them, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty cool job i would say and uh I definitely gets you like i said thinking a lot differently about your own textures and your own sounds and the way you go about creating your own music whether it's for scores or for new music or ensembles or whatever whatever it may be thinking about sounds and thinking about if you're able to capture them and really really learn how to kind of sculpt them in the way that may take you by surprise um you can make some pretty iconic stuff um yeah, I don't know how we're doing on time. How are we doing on time? Yeah, um, we have about 10 minutes. Okay. And maybe it'd be a great time to take take some more questions. Please. Yeah, go for it, Matt. Uh, so one of my favorite movies of all time is Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> that I know Hans Zimmer uh, did the score for. I didn't know if, if you were working for him around that time, if he would have had any uh, specific experiences creating that, that soundtrack. So uh, that was before my time. I was there when we were working on Kung Fu Panda 3, um, because I believe he did Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2 with John Powell, who also studied under him. He came from kind of his camp. Um, I got to say, of all the movies, Kung Fu Panda 3 was the one I was probably the least involved with. I think we did some some Tam Tam strikes and some, you know, I think we had some, uh, you know, bamboo percussive little elements that we used as accents for that project as well um but I, I will tell you he loves animation i mean animation is such a fun fun um world to explore and i think for film composers it can be kind of challenging because a lot of directors i mean animations take years to come out right we worked on the boss baby part one and that was six years in the making and for those six years they had temp music that was in it and so by the time it got to us, the director had to like unlearn all the temp music that they used from various other composers. And now most of the time, a lot of our scores, the scores that Hans is working on, they're temp with his own music, but they get so attached to it in a way that it's very difficult for them to, to separate that from what is being created at the studio. But I, I got to say, working on animation stuff is really, really, really fun. Um, so I'm sorry to say I didn't work on the first two. I did work on the third one just a little bit. But again, it's about taking kind of those fun elements and seeing how can we take some of these goofy things and, you know, should there be a fourth one or fifth one or 12th? Cause that's what everybody's doing these days. I'm sure we're gonna find even more weird ways to, you know, to, to make, I'm really surprised we actually haven't made like, you know, like, like a dim sum ensemble or something. Cause I know that's such a big part of those movies is like, you know, well, now that I put it in the universe, I'm sure I'm gonna get a phone call. It's he's probably going to tell me to go to every like dim sum restaurant in LA and <laughs> try to sample the steam coming from it. But anyways, yeah. Anyone else? Question? Yeah. Um, so you obviously work a lot recording sounds for Hans Zimmer, but do you ever make your own music with the sounds that you record for him? 
He, uh, I never do it with his sounds. Those are very, very much his, uh, his tools. Um, cause if I did, then I, I would have a very just different job at this point, but I was able to just steal all his stuff, but it definitely has gotten me to use and implement my own textures and my own sounds, you know, in, in my podcast space that I create these narrative fiction podcasts, I kind of implement, them, implement those into the stories as well. You know, I kind of range anywhere from romantic comedy to horror, to action and thriller. And I always try to find ways to to bring that into, um, you know, my my own scores, even the sound design for my own projects. You know, I recently did a horror project and I really wanted to create these these textures underneath. And, um, you know, one of the characters has trouble breathing. And so I wanted to have, you know, record them choking and even doing long winds and catching their breath. And I kind of turned those into a pad that weave in and out. And they're kind of tucked away underneath the sound design um, in the project. So, you know, I, I try to find ways to implement that. But that's also, like I said, it's also changed the way that I write my stories and I build them because I'm building it now around some of those textures. So um, I definitely don't use any of his samples on any of my projects. But, you know, it's definitely gotten me to think more about how I'm going to take those, take my own brain and when I'm building out my scores or my music, what are some fun ways that we can implement that? And, you know, I work with a lot of, there's no shortage of, you know, Ed Sheeran and Swifty fans and, you know, all these people out here who want to work on stuff. So it's really fun to kind of work with them and say, hey, have you ever thought about taking organic found sound and implementing it into your music? And it's really kind of funny how many of them are like, wait, no, I never thought about it. I didn't wait. I, it's not just 808s and pianos. Like I can, it's not just a bunch of like, wow, I didn't even think about that, you know, but finding that balance between like what's overkill and cheesy and just for the novelty sake. And then also finding a way to actually help it with the story that takes a little bit of time, but um, yeah. So I definitely create my own sounds and my own samples for all of my projects. What would you say is like the most important choice that like you made that set you on the path to your career right now? Um, wow. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Uh, I don't know if this so much was a choice as it was something that just happened. Um, you have to, you have to be ready to fail. I'm just going to be honest with you. You have to, and not look at that as you're done. Right. Um, I was very timid my first several years at Hans's studio and for many reasons, because it is Hans Emmer, but also because I, you know, I, I never wanted to do a poor job. I just wanted to make sure everything was right and good and proper. And in meetings, I would go in and I'd keep my head low and I'd take notes. I wouldn't really make eye contact. He'd be talking to all of us and I'm saying, okay, yeah, I got it, whatever. And I'd give him what he wanted, but I wasn't really pushing it. And I wasn't really contributing other than just doing my job. And it actually got to a point where, you know, well, I was going in to talk about, you know, the next stages and where I'm, where I'm at and how everybody's feeling. It was like, yeah, you know, you're new, you're learning and he knows you're a hard worker, but you're not contributing. You're not offering your own input, your own ideas. It's a collaborative space at the end of the day. He's the one that bears the weight of what happens by the end. But, um, it, it, you know, it got me to a point where he even, took, he, you know, he said like, hey, he does great work, but he's not contributing in these meetings. There's no way I can interpret that Interpret that other than him just not being interested. So if he doesn't have anything to contribute, you know, he doesn't have to be in these meetings. And I was like, what? I thought you had to be quiet and just do your thing and take notes and stuff. And the truth is that, you know, it really is a collaborative um, environment. And I was just too afraid to mess up, but you can't be afraid to mess up because nobody wants you to fail. But if you do, people are there to support you because it's not about you. It's about everybody and building the stuff together. Um, it takes a lot of confidence, you know, and it's not even like I know everything about I certainly don't know everything about sampling. I've continued to learn every single day as technology has changed, as ideas are being birthed. Um, but you, you can't let fear control everything. I mean, just the quote from Frank Herbert from Dune, fear really is the mind killer. And if you let it control everything you do, you're never going to be able to take yourself by surprise. And if you can't take yourself by surprise, how are you going to take anybody else by surprise? You know, we're artists. We need to share our story and collaborate and share stories with each other. So um, I, I would really say that at the heart of everything, besides working hard and, you know, all that gross Hollywood networking crap, like none of that really matters at the end of the day. What really matters is that you're going to be true to yourself and you're going to put yourself in situations 
that you're going to have to challenge yourself because at the end of the day, nobody's going to do it for you. Um, and it takes some time to get there, but ultimately people really want to see you succeed. Um, stress levels are high. As much as Hans is the king of his own castle, he has a boss he has to answer to, and they have a boss they have to answer to. It all comes down. So the more you're able to be open and communicate and know that you're all really in it together, I think that's kind of when the magical stuff can happen. So you, you just, you, you got to throw yourself in it and you have to have fun with it and want to learn. The second you think you know what you're doing, you've already kind of lost space in that environment. So just keep learning, you know? Well, anybody else? Excellent. Is there, yeah, maybe one more question. Yeah, Matt. Um, so another one of my favorite movies is uh, Tenet, which the soundtrack is done by uh, Ludwig Göransson, I believe. Uh huh. Um, and I was curious, because I think that's the perfect example I can think of what you were describing earlier, like the, the main song has this driving bass line, dun, 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 yeah. which uh, was actually sampled from uh, the, the sound of an engine idling. Right. And, just, and I, I just thought that was, that was cool. I just wanted to throw that out there. That's probably my favorite example of using a sound you wouldn't think of, because you, you can't even tell by the end huh. that it yeah yeah it's taking that and then also in the theme of the movie of kind of going back and forth time from front to back and back to front i think he even like yeah. reversed stuff without you knowing that, that yeah. first. And, yeah. and like like the first scene that that um that that song shows up and he's like riding on the side of a fire truck right so it's pretty cool that they use the sound of an engine idling it's true and and that's the thing right it's disguising it enough so it's not so intrusive but somehow as humans as empathetic creatures we know this is related in one way or another so and i think i think that's really what it's about it's about working with the story together and and not it's not just about your music it's about making the music and the film be so unique and specific to what the story is and techniques like this are really fun you know so yeah i agree it's really cool